Today's show is all about uncommon vegetables, such as leeks, okra, artichokes, and garlic. First, I'm gonna start with one of my favorites, the globe artichoke, steamed and served with warm tarragon butter. Next, I'm gonna show you how to braise leeks with chicken stock, white wine, and butter until they are fork tender and so delicious. Fried okra that has been dipped in cornmeal and served with a squeeze of fresh lemon is just fantastic. We all use cloves of garlic, too, in our cooking. But did you know that you can roast whole heads, which totally changes the flavor? It's delicious when spread on a slice of crusty bread. Artichokes are a species of thistle that are grown as food. There are many different kinds of artichokes. This is a beautiful imperial star artichoke, and this is a green globe. Uh, this kind of artichoke is grown primarily in California. And uh, as you can see, artichokes have a very sharp thorn at the tip of each leaf. But don't let that intimidate you. Even if you get pricked by an artichoke, uh, take some home and master a few simple steps, and you'll want to eat them as often as I do. It's uh, easy to prepare an artichoke. You cut off the bottom stem like that. It's nice and white. Choose artichokes that are unblemished, that have no brown spots, uh, that are firm and heavy for their size. Artichokes um, are extremely healthy. Oh, by the way, look at this. Cutting right through with a serrated knife. And then I always kind of loosen them a little bit, like that. And then uh, it makes it easier to trim the tips of the leaves with sharp kitchen shears. And just cut like this all the way around. It takes a little bit of time. You can prepare your artichokes um, way before dinner time and put them in acidulated water, which is water in which uh, one or two lemons have been squeezed. This will prevent browning and uh, it'll actually add a nice little flavor to the meat of the artichoke. That's it, it doesn't take much time at all. And just put this right into the acidulated water. So you can see these are all beautiful. They still have the choke inside. This is the choke of the artichoke. It is where the thistle, um, I call it the hoary core, rests. And you'll remove that after cooking. So these are ready to put into steaming water in a steamer basket. This is a steamer basket. Every kitchen should have one of these. Fits nicely into this size pan. And then I steam upside down and quite a lot of salt in the water. I'd say a tablespoon, maybe even a tablespoon and a half of salt. Adds a lot of flavor to the artichokes. And I often put even more lemon right on top of the artichokes. Just squeeze lemon juice right on that cut stem end, like that. And you can throw the lemon right in there, too. In fact, I'm just going to throw these lemons into the water. Like that. And I sprinkle with a little bit more salt on the stem end and a sprig of tarragon to flavor the water. Cover and steam. This is going to take about, oh, 35 minutes. And make sure that you have a full boil in order for the steam to really cook the artichoke quickly. Check every now and then, because uh, if that water disappears, you'll have burnt artichokes. So you might have to add some boiling water to the pot. So this is about a tablespoon of chopped fresh tarragon. And you add this to 3 quarters of a cup, one and a half sticks, of melted unsalted butter. I always like to add my salt rather than rely on salted butter. Uh, so let that just steep for a little bit. That is your butter sauce for the artichokes. Now let's see if the bottoms are easily pierced. Look how simply and easily the stem ends are pierced with that point of a knife. Every one. It's a little bit of resistance, but not very much. The artichokes are done. So now remove them 
And I either put them on a towel, upside down, just to let all excess moisture run off like that. And they can cool just slightly. So use a, a spoon that has a nice sharp edge like that. And spread the artichoke. It's hot. Ooh. You can use this to start if you want and pull. That is edible, so save that intact if you can. And now we're down to the fuzzy choke. And this will easily scrape out with your spoon. This is what you want to get out of there. All of that with very sharp thistly tips. That's the center of the thistle of the artichoke flower, not edible. Put this on the plate. And I like the way that Jean Georges serves this at the Marc restaurant. He has a little bit of frise in the center, a little bit of champagne vinegar, olive oil. Malden sea salt, and a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. Just toss that. And this can fill that center, like this, makes it pretty. Looks good. And your tarragon butter, serve that in a little dish on the side. This is enough butter for at least four artichokes. And accompany the whole serving with your butter. Some wedges of freshly cut lemon, sprinkled with a little bit of the mold and salt, tiny bit more pepper, a little lemon juice. And to eat, well, it's very simple. You just pull off a leaf like that this is the meaty part of the leaf. Dip it in the tarragon butter. Mmm. Drag the leaf against your teeth. Perfectly cooked. I don't know if there is any truth to it being said that artichokes are an aphrodisiac, but they are one of my favorite vegetables. While leeks may be a member of the onion and garlic family, they have a sweeter, more delicate flavor that lends a subtle accent to a variety of recipes. They're my favorite onion garlic uh, member, and I just adore them. This is a well-grown young leek. They can be sauteed, baked, roasted. My favorite way to prepare leeks is to braise them like they do in France. Good quality leeks are firm and they're smooth and they're free of any blemishes. And to prepare them, cut off the green leaves, reserve these leaves. You can soak them in a little water to make sure there's no dirt accumulating um, in this part of the leaf, this V form. See, there's a little dirt right there because they do grow so close to the, um, to the garden soil. And cut off the root end right here right below where the roots start. This is important because you do not want the leaves to separate. Each leaf is separate, and if you cut, I'll, I'll show you, if you cut up here, and when you cut the leek in half like this, you're just gonna have just a bunch of leaves. That's not what you want. So be very, very careful when you cut the leek. I'll reserve this for the stock pot. So now cut only to the beginning of the roots. Now this will not fall apart. Take the leaves off and slice the leek in half lengthwise. See, this will not fall apart. Now these have to be washed. Put this uh, leek and all the other cut leeks in a bowl of uh, water and rinse very, very well to get all that dirt out. And then put, the, put them back together like that and they're ready to cook. We have some that are all ready for the beginning process of the braising. I like to brown the leeks just slightly in 
oh, about three tablespoons of butter in a big, heavy skillet. The leeks will actually braise in this same skillet. Once the butter is bubbling and melted, uh, put the leeks in the butter, cut side down. Three minutes on the cut side, then turn them over three minutes on the rounded side. So let's see how these are. Yep, this slightly, lightly colored. Gently turn. So this has about a minute more to brown. Uh, we have to make a cartouche or a piece of parchment that will cover the contents of the pan. This is very easily done if you take a piece of parchment big enough to fit in the pan and fold it into first a rectangle, then a square, then a triangle, and then another triangle. So you're gonna have 16 segments like that. Hold this in the center of the pan and mark this. This will be exactly right and cut it off like that. Easier than tracing and cutting all the way around. So see, I have a perfect cartouche which will fit right down on top of the cooking leeks. So now turn the leeks over again so that the rounded outside is facing up. These have gotten a, a really beautiful golden brown color. You don't want to get them too dark. You don't want to burn them. There. Okay, so now add your liquids and salt and pepper. Sprinkle with coarse salt and black pepper or white pepper. A half a cup of chicken broth. This is a homemade chicken stock and a half a cup of dry white wine. Cover with your cartouche. Now this cartouche really is uh, meant to uh, control the rate of evaporation and all those flavors in the liquid are imparted to the leeks. Now, and vice versa, of course. Now turn this down very low and continue cooking. Uh, for leeks this size, about 15 minutes. For bigger, fatter leeks, it's gonna take longer. But when you pierce the leek with a uh, paring knife, uh, the leek must be very tender. So we're just gonna wait for 15 minutes until we're done. Now to check the doneness, just lift the parchment up. <gasps> look how good they look. And pierce with the point of a sharp knife. Look tender. They look buttery and delicious. It's been 15 minutes. You can just remove the parchment to a waste bowl. Can't use that again, so don't worry. And now remove the leeks a couple at a time and place on your serving platter. And these look good. Now, to embellish some nice coarsely chopped parsley right here at the tips. and mold and salt. I love this salt because it, look how crystalline it is. It's really shiny and beautiful and a little crunchy. And people love this. And I'm just gonna put a little row of salt here. And some freshly ground black pepper over the whole thing. And there you have a really, really beautiful, savory vegetable dish that everybody's going to love. I think you're going to really like making these and eating this easy classic French recipe. Now, this is okra. It's known as a Southern favorite, but the rest of America is beginning to catch on to this delicious vegetable. Today, I'm gonna to show you one of the most common and best ways to cook it. If you've never tried okra before, this is a great recipe. Now it's essential that you get okra that is tender, uh, very nicely colored, no brown spots. It shouldn't be shriveled and it shouldn't be dry. And it should also be able to be cut easily with a knife. 
If the knife is offered any resistance whatsoever by the okra, that is way too old to cook. So just discard that. Now um, remember, uh, after you wash it, dry it very, very well. Pat it dry. I buy okra in the farmer's market, um, or I get it right out of my garden. It's a beautiful plant. It's related to the hibiscus family, and the flowers are very hibiscus-like. They are also edible. Uh, now to prepare for frying, just cut off the tops, the stem end, like this, and cut the okra into half-inch pieces. You see how easily this is cut? These little tips, well, they're not right for frying, so I just kind of discard those or add them to the stock pot. I like okra stewed, I like it in gumbo. But this is something that you'll all enjoy, fried okra coated in a cornmeal and served with a remoulade sauce. So here we have our okra already cut up. I have three egg whites in this dish and I'm going to thin those with three tablespoons of cold water. Whisk this up. Just break up the egg whites. And the oil is a vegetable oil. Uh, you could use olive oil if you like the taste of olive oil. You could use canola or just a good quality vegetable oil. So get this a little frothy. And I suggest, well, you have to use your fingers, so I suggest using one hand for the wet and one hand for the dry. In the cornmeal, uh, this is one cup of beautiful cornmeal. Quarter cup of flour is added to that. Use an unbleached flour. Half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, ground at, uh, as a little zip. And black pepper, a quarter of a teaspoon. And two teaspoons of salt. I think this kind of fried food needs salt. And this is not greasy fried food. This is like a, a little snack. So that's ready for dipping. OK, so we're working with a small amount of okra first. Just push this around in the egg white mixture, egg white and water. And then just place it in the cornmeal. And the oil should be heated to 375 degrees. So this looks good. Now you can just put all your coated okra onto a piece of parchment paper and drop these into the hot oil. Now these are browning very nicely, very quickly. These are done. Such a beautiful golden color. Just remove them to a paper towel covered baking sheet and start frying the next batch. I'll show you how easy it is to make a very flavorful remoulade. To one cup of mayo, you can use low fat mayo if you want or homemade mayo. Add one tablespoon of finely chopped parsley, a tablespoon of finely chopped basil leaves, two tablespoons of milk, which thins out the mayonnaise a little bit, quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, two teaspoons of finely chopped shallot, some salt, two um, tablespoons of champagne vinegar, and a squeeze of lemon juice. Also serve these, if you will, with some wedges of lemon. People like lemon and okra. Stir this all up. This you can make the day before and get all the flavors melded together. It's a very delicious remoulade. So we have right here a platter and some remoulade sauce. You can just put the first batch of okra here. Don't forget to sprinkle it with salt while it's still hot. And then dip it in your remoulade and taste. Mmm, really, really good. I think that batch is for me. You can make all the rest for you. 
Garlic is one of those vegetables that is never at the center of the plate, yet it is essential in nearly all of the world's cuisines. But today we're going to make garlic the star by roasting it whole. As the garlic roasts, it transforms into sweet caramelized cloves that you can use with just about anything, pasta, potatoes, meat, fish, or simply spread on your favorite crusty bread. Now, garlic comes in two uh, ways, basically. Hard neck, which this is. You can see how hard this long stem is, um, or soft neck. Uh, choose bulbs that are large and plump and firm. And garlics generally have anywhere from six to 24 cloves inside. As garlic ages, it starts to shrivel and begins to sprout little green sprouts. Those garlics you should avoid. Those green sprouts uh, create a bitterness in the cloves of the garlic that just are not very tasty. Good quality garlic uh, will keep, uh, I just keep it right on my counter uh, for up to about three or four weeks. Uh, if you want to prolong the life of garlic, you can also keep it in the dry area of your refrigerator, well wrapped in a uh, paper towel or a brown paper bag. So now, to roast the garlic. Uh, first, cut off, make sure it's nice and clean, and uh, any loose skins uh, removed. Cut off about an eighth of the top of the clove. There. Right through the hard neck, which is in the center. So there you're exposing a little bit of the top of the cloves of the garlic. And I just leave the root end right on and do it to this one. This one has still one little piece of papery skin. I grow a lot of garlic and it's now just uh, getting uh, ready to consume. It's been drying in my barn, and oh, it is so beautiful, the garlic. There, shake out, that's another beautiful one. This has six, this has nine cloves of garlic in it. A little bit of salt and pepper right on the top of the flesh. Now I have a piece of foil lined with parchment. I like to uh, roast, uh, not against the aluminum foil, but always in parchment if possible. A little bit of coarse salt, and a sprinkling of olive oil. Just a tiny bit for flavor, as well as a little bit of moisture. Here you have your little package. Put it in your preheated oven uh, at 425 for about an hour to an hour and a quarter. And when it comes out, well, you'll see. So now unwrap your garlic. It smells really delicious and it looks mighty delicious also. Look at this, caramelized. Very, very pretty. Mm. Now you'll see how utterly tender it is when I take one clove out. You can, these pop right out of the papery shell like this. And it's soft and just toasty, crusty bread, and it's almost like garlic butter. That's what it reminds me of. And this may actually be your new favorite way to eat garlic. Thanks all of you for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of Cooking School. Begin by removing the outer leaves of eight baby artichokes, then trim both the bases and the tops. Transfer to a bowl of acidulated water. Pat dry and thinly slice on a mandolin. Drizzle with olive oil and lemon juice. Season with coarse salt and pepper and toss to combine. Serve on a bed of escarole with shaved Parmesan cheese and basil. So today it's all about vegetables fresh vegetables. And these can be purchased at your local farmer's market, and I certainly hope you are uh, going to the farmer's markets to see what's in season, what's fresh, what's healthy, what's good. Um, and all of these uh, vegetables came from the farmer's market this morning here in New York City. And it's best to eat in season and local if you possibly can. Today I'm going to show you how to make a delicious uh, dish out of two kinds of peas, sugar snap peas, which are these edible pod peas, which are so crispy and fresh, and shell peas, which yield 
beautiful fresh peas like this right out of the shell. Some mint and some spring onions. These are really the big bulb onions, but pulled young, this is what they look like. They're not scallions, they're not chives, they're spring onions. And these just uh, clean well, take off any excess outer skin, and slice the white parts of the onion very thinly with your knife. And you saute these in a little bit of butter and olive oil until they're tender. Also, bring a big pot of water to a boil, salt it generously with kosher salt, and the sugar snaps will choose plump, smooth-looking, crisp pods with a bright green color, and also have a good number of small seeds inside. If you open up a sugar snap pea, and if you let these go too long, if you're growing them, you can actually shell them for shell peas, but look how many little bright peas are inside this pod. That's a very nice sugar snap pea. That's the size I like even for the shell peas. Okay, so in our pan, a tablespoon of olive oil and a tablespoon of butter. And you can just start very slowly cooking the spring onions. And in rapidly boiling salted water, put your shelled peas. And these should cook for three minutes in boiling water. Look, they immediately change to a bright, bright green upon hitting the water. And look how fantastic these look. Taste the biggest one. Needs a slightly bit more time. And there, now, with this nice wire spider, which is really a Chinese tool, um, you can scoop out the peas and put them into a strainer sitting in a bowl of iced water. And so those will now chill, lock in the color, lock in a lot of the flavor. Now into the same water, put your sugar snap peas. These should not take too long to cook. And again, they take on a vibrant green color draining the peas right here on the paper towel. Now the onions are just right, getting soft, translucent. Mm, so pretty. And you can get these right into the iced water also. And these can go right into your hot butter and onions. And you add your Shell peas. Now, what could be easier than that? Fresh, green, delightful vegetables. Flavorful, pretty. Oh, don't forget the last little fabulous taste, and that's mint, fresh mint. You don't want a lot of mint. You don't want it to overpower the peas. So oh, a tablespoon or two of torn mint leaves would be just perfect for this. And don't forget a little flavoring of salt and pepper. Mm, so pretty, so full of protein, fiber, vitamin C, thiamine, vitamin B6, folic acid, iron, niacin, riboflavin, magnesium, and potassium, all in this bowl. Can you believe it? Well, they're there. Try them, they're very good for you, and they are delicious. Now, carrots are my go-to vegetable for when I'm really desperate for something green, I cook up some orange carrots. They're very versatile. They can be served raw in salads, they can be steamed, they can be roasted, and they can even be braised, of course. Uh, when you're buying carrots, look for bright colored carrots with smooth skin and a firm texture. And uh, this is a very nicely formed carrot with nice long tops. And the tops should be attached when you buy them. That's buying organic, uh, which we should all do if we can as often as possible. Uh, and here I'm just cutting the carrot tops off, reserving a few of the carrot leaves uh, for this dish because they are a vegetable. The leaves are a vegetable as well as the root. 
and peel with one of these little hand peelers. Uh, you want one that doesn't take off too much of the peel, just enough. Takes that tougher outer skin off. Um, and there, it's a very nice, clean carrot. And this recipe is called brown sugared carrots. So peel and have lengthwise one to one and a half pounds of carrots. Try to have them pretty much the same size. Ready to cook the carrots. In a large skillet, large enough to hold all of the carrots, heat two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil and cook the carrots in that pan until they start to lose some of their moisture, move them around, coat them with the oil. So now while you're sauteing, add a little bit of salt to your carrots. This does actually help pull the moisture out of the carrots and makes it easier once you add the sugar to caramelize those carrots. You can add a little bit of pepper too. Now again, by cooking, you really enhance the color of these carrots. They're a brighter orange than they were when you put them in the pan. While this is all going on, you could, at the same time, make your garnish of green carrot tops. These are very uh, greatly enhanced if you fry them. So these are just pieces of the carrot top, and I have some grapeseed oil heating here in this pan. Oops! <laughs> Watch out, it does splatter. Oh yeah, this does a very nice quick fry and that'll be a pretty garnish. So I'll just add a bunch of these and stand away. They have a lot of moisture in them. And fry until a little bit crispy. So after about three minutes, add your sugar and molasses. That's one tablespoon. two tablespoons, and one tablespoon of molasses. Ooh. Very pretty, look how they fry. And cooking them in something like a grapeseed oil is very good because that has a very high smoking point. Look how beautiful they look. And again, stir the carrots. Now, if you left this cooking without any additional moisture, uh, you might get some burned carrots. So I would suggest adding a little bit of water. And keep cooking, watching, until the carrots are tender. And you might add up to, oh, about a cup of water if your carrots are large and tough. So now while the carrots are cooking, add a sprig or two of fresh rosemary just into that thickening sauce. And they're starting to get a little tender. Watch the point of a knife just be up, just starting to penetrate easily. When it goes through easily, you know that it's done. Now before you turn these off, uh, put a small piece of butter, oh, about a tablespoon and a half, into the pan. And now you can scoop these out onto a platter and garnish with your fried carrot tops. How unusual and how beautiful. A delicious and slightly unusual way to serve carrots. Your family's going to adore them. I grew up in Nutley, New Jersey, and I must say, there is nothing we wait for more than July and August Jersey corn. People look forward to it all year long. Corn begins to lose its sweetness the moment it is picked. All those delicious sugars start to turn to starch. So the faster you cook it, after it's picked, the better. Uh, and I always ask, when was this corn picked when I go to the farm stand? 
And uh, if the answer is anything but, oh, an hour ago or this morning, I don't buy the corn. So I want to show you basically one way to cook the corn because people are always asking how long do you cook it, what do you do with it, how do you serve it, and this is just stovetop corn in a large pot of boiling salted water. Some people add milk to the water, some people add sugar to the water. I just add salt, especially if you have good, fresh, sweet corn. Put your corn cobs into the rapidly boiling water and try to clean the corn really well. Get all the pieces of silk off it and you wanna shuck it so that the ears are nice and clean and let that cook and time it. Five minutes for a fresh picked small kernel corn, maybe a few more minutes for the larger kernels uh, like this. Bring it to a rapid boil. When you're choosing corn, always look for ears with bright green, snugly fitting husks and golden brown silk. And inside, the kernel should come um, all the way to the very top. And you want to buy the corn that you love the best. Yellow corn has larger, fuller flavored kernels. White kernels are generally smaller and sweeter. This has been in for six minutes. Just drain it on a cotton towel, and you can cover it with a cotton towel too. That'll keep it nice and steamy hot till you get it to the table. Looks good, smells good. So what I like to do is just take the ear of corn and a tablespoon of butter and just hold it like this and coat the whole thing with butter. And then as much salt as you like. Sprinkle the whole thing and just start chomping away. That's corn on the cob. Now here is an alternative method of eating corn that I find utterly delicious. I went to Mexico City last year and I couldn't believe how fabulous the Mexican street corn was. It's served on sticks like that and the corn is coated with either sour cream or a tablespoon or so of mayonnaise, hot corn, just Slather on the mayo. Ugh, it's so good. And now sprinkle with a little cayenne pepper all over and roll this corn right into queso fresco, Mexican white cheese. And serve that just like that with some wedges of fresh lime. That's Mexican corn on the cob. It's best to spread the condiments on the corn while it's still hot, and that'll ensure that the fats will melt in between the kernels, providing even more succulent eating. So whether you choose to have Mexican corn like this, or just plain corn on the cob with butter and salt, they're both delicious. Enjoy. So now I want to tell you a little bit about broccoli rob. It's uh, actually more closely related to the turnip than to broccoli, even though some of the plants do produce these little tiny broccoli-like florets, and sometimes these turn yellow uh, as they open. Uh, broccoli rob is named after the Italian word for turnip, rapa, and it is a very delicious, slightly strong green that's easy to prepare and uh, delightful to serve. Now, this is how it comes in the grocery store, cut like this into almost equal length pieces. Always trim off the cut ends, just to give you a fresh start. And then I like to actually take the uh, broccoli rob and cut off the thicker part of the stems like that, and I start cooking them first because they're a little bit tougher. The leaves cook much, much faster. We're using one and a half pounds of broccoli rob trimmed and washed well. In a pot of boiling salted water, blanch first the stems. This is going to tenderize and, uh, and make more palatable the vegetable itself. And this is going to take about 40 to 60 seconds for the stems. Add the thinner stems. Toast some pignoli nuts, about three tablespoons of pignoli nuts in a dry skillet. And now we can add the leaves. And one and a half pounds 
will cook down to a lesser amount. So here's our nuts toasting. The way you tell that the nut is toasted is to smell it. Before it turns brown, you start to get the smell of the pignoli nuts. Now shock it. So pretty, so green. And this ice water will indeed set the color. And so once your nuts are toasted and your broccoli rob is blanched, heat a tablespoon of olive oil in the skillet. Add your beautifully blanched broccoli rob. And this is to warm it up. And you can zest some lemon, which tastes very excellent on the broccoli rob. I don't put the lemon on until after the broccoli rob has been warmed. Just save it here on the side. And keep tossing. It's an excellent source of vitamin A, C, and K. It's also extremely flavorful. So now I think we can remove it to the platter. Sprinkle with your pine nuts. And of course with your lemon zest. And here a little bit of salt, a tad more pepper, and there you have broccoli rob, perfectly cooked and delicious. Now it might seem obvious to most of you, but this is an acorn squash. It is a winter vegetable. The pale orange flesh is tender with a flavor reminiscent of hazelnuts and pepper. And most people would simply eat the flesh, but this would mean that they're missing out on the vital antioxidants and nutrition that the skin provides. So to prepare this particular recipe, have the acorn squash. Now this is a little bit difficult to do. You must have a very, very sharp knife uh, to cut this in half straight down. There we go, through the segments. Now we are going to take out all these seeds. I find that an ice cream scoop with this very sharp edge really works very well for this task. Uh, but you might have your favorite um, sharp spoon in your kitchen. So uh, cut this into wedges about an inch thick at the widest. Again, it's really good to have a sharp chef's knife like this to do this task. Two tablespoons of olive oil all over the squash. And sprinkle with some coriander, a quarter of a teaspoon. And a quarter of a teaspoon of cumin and about an eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Toss this and try to coat each wedge with the oil and the spice. Oh, don't forget salt and pepper. And a big pinch of pepper. Have your oven preheated to 425 degrees. It looks very good. Spread this in one layer, and we're roasting directly on the metal instead of on parchment or something because we really want the squash to brown. Now this will be roasted for about 30 minutes, flipping once. So the squash is roasted for 30 minutes. Now, if you can pierce it easily with the point of a knife, and this pierces extremely easily, just like butter, uh, you can be assured that it will be done enough to eat. And the skin itself is so pretty, all nicely roasted, and just arrange it on a serving platter. You can do the same thing with the butternut squash. Doesn't need anything else to be a very tasty and beautiful, little tiny bit more salt and it's ready to serve. Acorn squash skin, this dark skin, actually provides an array of phytonutrient benefits, which 
means they help the body get rid of toxins. So eat up some acorn squash. Now, just as broccoli was the king of the vegetable kingdom a few years ago, it is said now that kale is king because it's one of the most nutritious vegetables. This very hearty member of the cabbage family, cruciferous family, is an excellent source of vitamin A, C, and B6. And this recipe for a lemony kale salad will certainly make you a believer that kale is king. So tear the kale into small pieces, removing the very thick rib down the center of a kale leaf. This is green curly kale. Uh, this is what it looks like, a nice big curly leaf like that. This is available regularly in the grocery store. This is dinosaur kale, which is also a commonly available kale. And it is a beautiful kale, and very nice for this salad also. And this is Russian red kale, which is similar to the green curly, but it has a very uh, sort of reddish purple stem and veins in the leaves. So all of these are commonly available. Uh, we'll need about, oh, a half a pound of kale for this particular salad. And once you get the leaves off the coarse stem, just coarsely chop the leaves. Nice and crunchy. The leaves should not be wilted. They should not be flaccid. They should not be brown in any way. Uh, and that's probably enough kale for our salad. And now for the dressing, so simple. Uh, just a quarter of a cup of olive oil, the juice and zest of a lemon. So we are going to zest the lemon first before we juice it. Fine, fine zest, perfect for salads. And now the juice of the lemon. And these lemons are so big that I like to, if I'm going to use one of these hand juicers, just cut off the ends of the lemon. These juicers are great because they eliminate the seeds and uh, let you get almost all the juice out of the skin. So very good. You can whisk that out and salt and pepper. So it almost emulsifies. It's so pretty. Mm, how beautiful. Now add your kale. Now this salad can be made, oh, early in the day because the longer it sits, kind of the better it gets. A third of a cup of toasted blanched hazelnuts. This is a delicious salad. You can put it into a serving bowl, of course. and garnish it with some shreds of Parmesan cheese. Vegetables are so important to a healthy, well-balanced diet. Now that you have some new recipes, try eating more vegetables. But try to remember also to buy fresh, local, and what's in season. You'll add both nutrients and variety to your family's dinners. Join me next time on Martha's Cooking School. Now this might seem very, very basic to many of you, but indeed, if you follow these steps, you will have perfectly beautiful, crispy vegetables for your crudite and for the rest of your meal. And now we're gonna start with the mildest of the vegetables in front of me, snow peas. Snow peas should be flat and green with just a little hint of the actual peas inside. And for preparation, basically that's the stem end, just pull, and get that little tiny string off the pea. This can be done the morning of a meal or a party. Uh, it can even be done the day before, but not too much more in advance. Now, on a stove, bring a big pot of water to a raging boil. Add, oh, about a teaspoon of salt. The salt really does help flavor the vegetables. Same thing goes for the sugar snaps. If they have a stem end on, just break that off. 
We have purple beans, which are very pretty, but when you cook them, they get a little paler. Now, yellow beans, I love these. They're also known as wax beans. See how beautiful they are, a uniform color, plump, crispy. They should snap when you snap them, just like that. Um, they should not look like this. This is a bean that should be thrown away. That's not what you want to buy. You want to buy firm, crispy beans. Uh, these are haricot vert, very fine string beans. That too, just pull off the stem end. Uh, and some people don't even like this little point and cut that off too. I actually like the little point, so I leave them on, especially for crudite. So let's put the snow peas into the boiling water. Now these will stay in from 30 seconds to 60 seconds. This is blanching. Now look what's happened already. Look at the color. These are so beautiful. Okay, now here I have a large bowl filled with iced water and a strainer right inside. Okay, these are already blanched and now we're going to shock them or another thing to call this is refresh them in the iced water. So you can do a whole lot of vegetables quickly this way. Just keep a little assembly line going. So while those shock, put in your snap peas. Now while those are in for 45 uh, seconds to a minute, shake the excess water off your snow peas and put them on a baking sheet that has a towel on it. So these are ready. Mm. Really crispy, but tasty. The flavor has really come out. You can do all of this in the morning before your party, and they'll look very, very nice at six o'clock for cocktails. Now look at the color. <gasps> so amazing. There's a big transformation. Right into the ice bath. Now, don't start with the purple. The purple are gonna lose their color. Start with the lightest color of the string beans. That would be the wax bean. Now I have a rack here because I don't want any moisture on the vegetables. Notice I put a piece of plastic wrap over the cookie sheet, a cake rack, and then another towel. And you can just take your peas and lay them out in a very thin pile. And they're not quite dry. A little moisture is okay, but they don't wanna be sitting in water. And I would just put that up like that. Now beans are gonna take a little bit longer than peas. The way I test is when I put them in, it was kind of, they were kind of stiff. It's sort of like asparagus. If they flop a little bit, I feel that they're done enough. These are flopping. So now that can go right into the ice water. Refresh the ice water, add more ice cubes if the ice cubes start to melt. Now the haricot vert. Now haricot vert, despite their thinness, are a little tough. So they might take a little bit longer than a wax bean to cook. Now I love what happened to the wax beans. You see the color is really, really pretty. Another thing that I do with string beans or any of these, these can then, like the, like the sugar snaps, if you wanna serve them with your dinner, keep them cool like this, then put them in a tiny bit of very hot water in a skillet with a tablespoon of butter, salt, pepper, heat them up that way, and you have perfectly cooked vegetables. Okay, so here we go with the wax beans. The haricot vert. As I said, these take a little bit longer. The purple string beans. Oh, now look at the color. Now, if that could only say, but the purple vegetables that are becoming very popular now, purple cauliflower, purple broccoli, they all kind of fade in the water. See, they don't maintain that gorgeous color, but they're still tasty. Someone, a hybridizer, if they work on this and get the string bean to stay purple, wow, would that be great. Okay, so now make sure the moisture is gone and then you can start arranging these. So make little piles in your hand and, and choose pretty glasses. This is just one way to serve these blanched vegetables. Have patience, don't rush, enjoy what you're doing. And we're serving our crudite with a delicious cucumber ranch dip.
So if you're blanching vegetables like broccoli, make sure you cut that uh, vegetable all to uniform size if you're gonna be doing blanching like this. Well, this is starting to look just amazing, I think. You need a few more sugar snaps here in this glass and you have a very healthy and delicious crudité. Enjoy. A lesson in vegetable preparation wouldn't be complete without a recipe for a tian. A tian is a traditional dish from Provence. It's named for the earthenware baking dish in which the vegetables are cooked. Now for this tian, I've looked for firm, small to medium vegetables. Skin on squash should be unblemished, nice and firm, no soft spots. And uh, cut off the stem end as well as the end of the vegetable and uh, cut in uniform slices. I'm using a chef's knife for this. Make sure you get the same thickness of slices for all the vegetables. So here we have these lovely yellow squash. Now, if you're going to use eggplant, and I think eggplant is very delicious in a tian, uh, don't choose this uh, kind of Italian eggplant. Look for the Japanese if you can. This doesn't really need to be salted. The salt brings out the excess bitterness from the flesh. So try to find the Japanese eggplant. And this too, cut off that little end. So this is a very pretty eggplant. It's a nice color skin and a very white, mild flesh. If you're growing eggplants, try to grow some of these Japanese uh, purple eggplants as well as white eggplants. And they also come in a kind of a lime green skin now. Farmers are growing extraordinary produce. Here's our zucchini. Now you can, if you want to make a very delicate tian, slice the vegetables half this thickness, like an eighth of an inch. Um, and those look very pretty. You can cook individual tians in small ramekins to serve with wreck of lamb. Very pretty too. And tomatoes, um, vine ripened of course. I'm using plum tomatoes because I find them less juicy but still very flavorful and they have a lot of meat. Uh, this is a country tian that I'm making. That's my excuse for uh, making it as simple as possible, country. I'm going to use the rectangular earthenware dish. It looks nice with what I'm serving. Just some grilled fish tonight. Oh, and here's a red onion. Oh, this is a perfect onion. Lovely. A sharp knife is essential when cutting vegetables like this. A garlic clove cut in half, just the flavor of garlic rubbed in the bottom of a dish imparts a terrific flavor in the tian. And now a tiny bit of olive oil. So now it's time to assemble. I'm gonna start with the onion and tomato. I'm gonna to put them in the middle of the dish and salt and pepper as you go along so that the vegetables do get flavor. And now on the sides, I'll do yellow squash, eggplant, green squash. So here we have our layering going on. And now just sprinkle over the leaves of some fresh thyme. You can put a few branches of thyme on the top and a few torn leaves of marjoram. So now a little bit more olive oil, but that is a vegetable tian. Now before I put this into a 400 degree preheated oven, I'm just gonna put a few garlic cloves on top. These will roast in the skins, and then you'll have them to squeeze out on the bread that you're gonna serve with dinner. So there, 400 degrees for 25 minutes. You can base with the pan juices and a brush and then bake for another 25 minutes. And then you have a real tian. And I have so many vegetables left over, I'm going to make another in this oval dish. I think that'll be pretty too. I think our tian are done. Oh yes, they smell extra good. Oh boy, look at how beautiful these are. Hmm. 
Not only are they good hot out of the oven, but they're also good later on today and even tomorrow. Tian, a very versatile way to use a lot of those vegetables. Once you learn how to make it, you can vary the ingredients. Whatever you choose, it's always good. Artichokes are high in magnesium and vitamin A, vitamin C, and very, very rich in fiber. Once you know how to prepare them, you're gonna discover how delicious they really are. So I'm taking off just about a half an inch of the top of the artichoke. And then for steaming and eating, take off the stem right below the lower level of, uh, of leaves. Snap off any smallish leaves and hear that snap, fresh. That's a sign of freshness. So these can all, you can save the, the stems and steam them too, they're very good. But uh, these are so big that I don't think we're gonna really need any extra artichoke. Now, with your kitchen shears, just take off that tip of the leaf. Each leaf has a thorn. Uh, artichokes are a thistle. And if allowed to go to seed, uh, they become great, big, beautiful, thistly like flowers on the stem. And uh, so there you have it. I like to loosen the leaves. Down inside is the core, which you will remove when it's cooked, and also the heart. The stem is the beginning of the heart that's inside, very meaty part of the artichoke. So now, if you're doing lots of these, immediately immerse the trimmed artichoke in a bowl of acidulated water, which is just cold water with lots of lemon in it. So these were prepared a little while ago and they have not browned at all. So this is good. We have a steamer basket inserted into this pan and these are gonna cook for approximately 40 minutes. So make sure you have enough water in your pan and the water is salted. So um, just put this cut side down on the steamer basket. We'll do three of these artichokes at a time because actually that's all I have room for in this pot. So if you're gonna do six, do two pots and you'll save time. Cover, 40 minutes. Artichokes are best used the day that you purchase them, but they can be stored, they uh, unwashed in a bowl in the refrigerator for up to four days. I like to cover it with a, a little bit of plastic wrap or even a, a dish towel. The peak season for eating artichokes grown in America is from March through May. And if you'd like to add a little bit more flavor to your artichoke, just throw in a little bunch of herbs. This is tarragon. And I just want to infuse a little bit more flavor in there. So that's the beginning of the cooking process. In 40 minutes, they'll be ready. Now these look done, but you must test. So poke the stem end with a knife. Oh, see how easily that inserts right into the stem end? And then I suggest pulling off a leaf and testing it for doneness with your teeth. Mm, the flesh comes right off, very tasty. Okay, they're ready to come out. And I suggest taking them out with a pair of tongs and putting them right side up. Cooking them upside down actually is a good way to do it because they don't get water soaked. Uh, they don't have a chance to get all soggy. Mm, these taste so good. Let them cool a little tiny bit while you prepare your melted butter. So we're gonna make some tarragon butter right now. And uh, per artichoke, sounds like a lot, but half stick of butter per person. They're not gonna eat it all, so don't worry. Just melt this with a little bit of tarragon. Just the, the leaves cut into little pieces. You don't have to finely chop it or anything. Now, another thing that you could do is um, a little bit of lemon juice into the butter. Half a lemon's fine. And these squeezers are great because they don't let any pits get in there. Very excellent. And I want to serve the artichokes on these beautiful oval dishes. We have some creamy, thick vinaigrette for those of you who don't like melted butter, and this little dish is for the melted butter. So now ready to prepare the artichokes. This is spreading nicely. You know that it's very well cooked. Take the center out 
And these come out nicely just by pinching them. See that? Now, I don't throw that away. I eat the little ends, but. And then with a spoon, just gently scrape down to the heart. That's what you're taking out. The, that's the thistly, uh, sharp part of the artichoke. You just throw that into the waste bowl. It's not edible. Now, you can serve it like, like this. You can put a pretty thin slice of lemon down on the inside, like that. And here's our butter already melted. Divide that evenly amongst all the cups. And that's your artichoke presentation. There are many, many ways to enjoy artichokes, but this is probably the simplest and the one I like the best. Enjoy. Sweet bell peppers come in many colors. They come in red and orange and yellow. They also come in purple and white and even brown, also green. These are my favorites for roasting on the fire. When roasted, they become sweeter and more supple and almost silky in texture. Let me show you first how to roast a pepper. Now, if you have a gas stove, that's great because you just put the pepper right on the gas flame like that. I just turn them all on and I roast a whole lot of peppers at one time. Uh, and this is not something that you do when you uh, get distracted and walk away. Stay, stay around the peppers. You can hear the skin spluttering, charring, bubbling. Now you can also roast on a grill very nicely. Uh, it gets a nice flavor too if you're doing a wood fire. Uh, you can also roast under a broiler. Uh, that's about the three best ways for accomplishing this simple task. You'll see, we're gonna get these peppers black on the outside. Now, uh, green peppers have a little bit thinner skin, so they don't work really, really well as, uh, as roasters. See how they're getting black? That's what you're looking for, but all over black. It's incredible how it does not burn the flesh, only the skin. And to loosen the skin, well, there are many different ways to do that. You can put the pepper in a paper bag and sweat it. Sweating allows the skin to come off even easier. Uh, you can sweat inside a piece of paper towel, which is my preferred way. Uh, you can also sweat the peppers in a bowl like this, covered with plastic wrap. Look at all the moisture on that plastic wrap. That's sweating. Oh, these are looking very good. Look at this one, oh, almost done. This one is pretty much 100% blackened. I can turn off that flame. Now, this is my favorite way of doing this. Take a piece of paper towel, wrap the pepper, and you'll see why I'm using paper towel in a few seconds. Put that right in a bowl like that. Okay, so this one can go over here. So now we have our peppers roasted. This is the sweated pepper in a bowl. Uncover it, take it out. Use the plastic wrap if you like. I always like to work on something because it's, this black stuff is really, really strong. Now, the skin comes right off. Look what's left underneath. Isn't that beautiful? That's your roasted pepper. So that's one way of doing it. Now here, this one's been sweating in paper toweling. And this is what I like to do. I just use the paper to pull off all the charred skin. Everything stays right in the piece of paper. It's neater. If you wash underwater, you would be taking away a tremendous amount of the flavor that uh, you've imparted to the pepper itself by roasting it. So here, that's your pepper. Work on a clean board. And then what I like to do is Cut the pepper in half. Take the stem end out and discard. Make sure that you cut also all the veins out of the pepper. Messy job, but somebody has to do it. Remove all the seeds. So here we have a beautiful pepper. Keep going until you have all the different colors peeled, seeded and quarter. Just toss them with some olive oil and balsamic vinegar, a little chiffonade of basil, 
to chiffonade basil, that's that very thin slivers of basil leaves, just stack four or five leaves on top of one another and roll the leaves up like that. Very simple. And then with a very sharp knife, just cut into very fine slivers. This will save you a lot of time by rolling and doing more than one leaf at a time. And it looks pretty, um, but this has to be done right before serving because you don't want these basil leaves to darken. There. And when you fluff that up, look, all pretty little chiffonade. Hard to tell what it is until you taste it. Okay, so because I'm leaving these in quarters, I, I just think it's pretty in an antipasto. Layer in a bowl. Alternating colors. Mm, so beautiful. And sprinkle with olive oil, balsamic vinegar, salt and pepper, little chiffonade. People love the taste of roasted peppers. And toss if you like. So pretty. Put that on your buffet. So just take a pepper, maybe two, on a piece of grilled bread. How pretty does that look? A couple of olives. Oh, a slice or two of very good salami and a couple of chunks of Parmesan cheese. Put that alongside your sliced steak or grilled fish and you have a really tasty meal. So now that you know how to prep and cook vegetables, you can incorporate vegetables so well into your meals in so many different ways. Remember to always use local and seasonal ingredients when possible. I'll see you on our next lesson of cooking school. I look forward to it.